Let's look at one of the most extraordinary Napoleonic Wars swords that you'll ever see. Hi folks, Matt Easton here of Scholar Gladiatoria and Easton Andy Carms, and you might be thinking, well, that's not the most extraordinary Napoleonic Wars sword I've ever seen. That's just a 1796 light cavalry sabre, and indeed, you're correct, it's not even particularly good condition. It's just a typical trooper's 1796 pattern light cavalry sabre. Actually, it's in reasonable condition. It's just a bit pitted and a bit dark. But this is one of the most um, famous and highly renowned swords of the last couple of hundred years. Um, just over that, in fact, say a say few hundred years, 300 years. And um, quite simply, this is a very popular sword, still popular today. The prices have just gone up and up since I started collecting antique swords. Why was this so popular? Simply because it was effective. It was much loved by uh, British troops and later by Indian troops, so much so that when this passed out of service and was replaced in 18, officially anyway, in 1821 by a new model of sword with a slightly different blade, a straighter blade, a longer blade, a bit more hand protection, the troops in India actually preferred this sword, so much so that by the 1850s, it went back into production. It's one of those cases that this went into production in 1796, officially stayed around until the 1820s when it was gradually uh, replaced by the new 1821 pattern. But amazingly, decades later, in the 1850s, we find Indian troops going, you know what, those old dragoon sabres, the crooked old dragoon sabre, as it's often referred to in period sources, we want that back. That was a better sword. So they went back into production. And even today, there are um, there's a couple of companies that make replicas of these. There's people that make bespoke ones of these. But the antiques are highly sought after. And everyone knows that these are, apart from the fact they look pretty damn awesome, they are formidable cutters. That's partly by virtue of the fact that it's a very broad blade. It's a curved blade. And it has what we call a hatchet tip. That is, the uh, point is situated towards the back of the blade and it broadens. So the blade is actually broader here than it is at the middle of the blade. So it is a chopper. Now, these aren't heavy. Um, these only weigh about 800 grams. They're not, they're not heavy swords. But the point of balance is fairly far from the hand. As you can see, it's about eight inches out. Um, so coupled with the point of balance or centre of gravity and coupled with the very broad and very thin flat blade, they have enormous cleaving potential. Now, a lot of people go, ah, oh, well, did you know that the French complained about these being used, that they were inhumane and barbarous? And it's complete rubbish. That's just uh, m like a massive urban myth. There's no evidence what's for, for it whatsoever. And moreover, the French had sort of similar and comparable sabres. They, they didn't have any quite as broad as this, or at least no standard models as broad as this. But nevertheless, a sabre's a sabre. It's going to, yeah, it lops bit off you. If it lops your arm off, then your arm's lopped off. It doesn't matter whether it's with this sabre or a French sabre or a Prussian sabre. Anyway, um, <laughs> end of rant. So this was a popular sabre. Now, what am I talking about the most extraordinary, in the true sense of the word, um, Napoleonic sabre? Well, let's just set a little bit more context, because I know you are salivating, waiting for me to show um, this sword that I'm talking about. But what went before that? Well, what's interesting, so this, is, this will become relevant. What went before that is the 1788 pattern light cavalry sword. Now, recently, in a recent video, is this the best sword ever made? Um, I showed the 1788 heavy, and you'll notice they're very different swords. The, the heavy cavalry sword is straight, it's what we call a palash, or you could call it a back sword, and it has a basket hilt on it. Now, these basket hilts actually come in a few different um, types, they're not all exactly the same. So you could say, um, and in fact, Henry Yallop from the Royal Armouries pointed out under one of my comments completely correctly, that we have to be a little bit careful referring to 1788 pattern swords because they're not as regular, they're not as uniform, they're not as much the same uh, as each other as the 1796 pattern onwards are. So 1796 really marked when a whole bunch of new military patterns came into the British Army and they were much more regulated. But nevertheless, in 1788, there were some patterns that were loosely adhered to. And this is what we would call a 1788 light cavalry sword. And that's a 1788 heavy cavalry sword. Now note, they are different types of swords. So the, the uh, preconception at this date was that heavy cavalry wanted a lot of hand protection and a straight blade. This was because of the assumed role of heavy cavalry that they would deliver 
heavy shock charges, including into infantry squares, and that they would possibly get into duking it out uh, at close range. So they wanted lots of hand protection, they wanted a big sword, remember they're on bigger horses as well, and they're generally bigger men, or at least they were supposed to be, certainly in, in terms of the horse guards, the lifeguards and the um, uh, the dragoon guards, they, they are generally selected to be taller and bigger than hussars, for example, or light dragoons. So in other words, they might duke it out uh, in close combat and so they need hand protection and they're on a bigger horse, they need a longer blade. They're also bigger guys so they can handle a bigger blade and they want a straight blade for delivering uh, good effective thrusts, a bit like a short lance. Okay, Light cavalry, in contrary, wanted a sword that was for hit and run. That was the preconception. So they were modelled on Eastern and Central and Eastern European hussars, okay, light cavalry, and that was very much what they model on. And these curved sabers came into countries like Britain. Originally, there'd been straight swords before that, for the most part. Obviously, curved swords still existed in falchions and hangers and stuff. But for light cavalry, these curved swords really came in in the late 18th century because of the fashion for hussars, and it came in with new styles of hat and new styles of jacket, pelisse, even trousers, um, and all sorts of other, even facial, you know, even hair and facial hair and all sorts. So the fashion changed. Austro-Hungarian fashion and Polish um, and so on was very fashionable, and it came in, and so did curved swords. Now, the preconception... We've talked about heavy cavalry. They were shocked. Bam! They were in there to go and duke it out and smash into enemy formations. The light cavalry were supposed to scout around. They were supposed to hit and run, maybe ride up to some artillery, to take out the gunners and then ride off again and hit somewhere else. Hit in the flanks and ride off. So they were supposed to stay in motion. So in theory, they didn't need a lot of hand protection. And also the curved blade, as well as essentially coming as a fashion thing uh, from Eastern and Central European fashions. Additionally, you could say if you're moving fast, it's easier to draw across a target and slash across a target with a curved blade than a straight blade. So, different ethos. Now, the same thing in 1796 was kept, okay? Curved swords came in in the form of the 1796 light cavalry saber and straight sword stayed a palash stayed for the heavy cavalry now we're not going to talk very much about heavy cavalry anymore now you will notice there are a couple of major differences between the new 1796 saber designed um, partly by jean gaspard le marchant um, which was inspired probably by hungarian um, uh, swords that were around austro-hungarian swords that were around before this and the previous 1788. Now, the first thing to note is that it is shorter. Okay, it is shorter and it is broader. But also there's a slightly different blade profile because, of course, you've got a broader and flatter and wider blade. So they took away some of the reach or length of the 1788, but arguably they made something which was a little bit more wieldy, a little bit quicker, a little bit nimbler maybe to handle. It's on average a little bit lighter, I think. Uh, but it, it has an enormous amount of cutting and slashing potential, and it's really specialised in that. It's given up some of its thrusting potential to make it a more effective cutter. Okay, So, bear in mind, they made a broader blade, they made a shorter blade, um, and they made something which is essentially a little bit more similar to some of the types of sabres that we see in Central and Eastern Europe. And some people have made some comparisons with the Indian Talwar and the Shamshir and things like that. I think those are very, very superficial comparisons this very much has its roots in uh, central and eastern europe now we finally get onto the most extraordinary napoleonic war sword you'll ever see now this is not an extraordinary sword because it's very valuable or because it's highly decorated or it belonged to anyone famous or it was used at uh, you know the battle of waterloo or any major action or anything like that it is extraordinary extraordinary because it is one of these, but it is extraordinary, literally, okay? So, here is the 1796 saber. I will stand back here. And here is the extraordinary version. <laughs> it's enormous! It's absolutely huge! It's, um, so, a bit, of, a bit of stats. I'm going to use inches here because I can reel them straight off my memory, okay? So, the standard 1796 light cavalry saber is, has got a 33-inch blade. 
Okay, the 1788, at least this example, as I said, they vary, but this example has a 35 and a half inch blade. This is actually bigger than normal. So that's a pretty big example. They're usually more like about 34. Okay, so 33 inch blade, 35 and a half inch blade. Now we've previously looked, just to briefly come back to the heavy cavalry at this example, this has a 38 inch blade, which is really long. It's you know pretty much as long as a French cuirassier's um, sword. But it's a cut and thrust sword. The cuirassier sword is really only a thrust sword. It's rubbish for cutting. Um, so this is a big, big sword, okay? Now, just for comparison, this is a 38 inch blade. This <laughs> monstrous 1796, you will see, is the same length. It is a 38 inch version of a 1796 light cavalry saber. It's absolutely humongous. Now, normally you can get away with having a blade this long because you've got a basket hilt, you've got a pommel, it balances back towards the hand, it is a tapering blade, still got a lot of mass near the hand. You do not expect to get a blade like this, as broad as this, <laughs> and as wide as this, in something as humongously long as this. Now, I genuinely don't think in all my years I have ever seen a saber of this sort of breadth that also has this sort of length. It's humongous. Now, amazingly, you might be thinking that thing must weigh a ton, Matt. It, it looks huge, doesn't it? But actually, it's actually quite nimble. And the reason is, it's got an enormous amount of distal taper. So it's the normal thickness down at the base here, but then from about there onwards, it's really, really thin and really, really flexible. So what was this made for? That's the obvious question. I honestly don't know. Um, the natural assumption, if you saw this in a book and saw its proportions and its, its, um, you know, its measurements in a book, and especially if you saw it next to a standard 1796 light cavalry saber, you would say, well, maybe it was made as a for a display, maybe to hang over a, a in a shop window or maybe over a door. It, it could have been made for that. Um, Maybe it was made for a really big person, uh, someone who was just really tall. Maybe they were like six foot eight, which would have been gigantic in the Napoleonic Wars. And maybe they just wanted a really big sword. Maybe, here's an idea. Maybe it was someone who knew that they were going to come up against or thought they would come up against heavy cavalry using humongous great long blades like this, maybe French cuirassiers. And we do have accounts from the Napoleonic Wars, particularly the Peninsula War, where um, it is mentioned that the British light cavalry had problems reaching cuirassiers. And of course, they're wearing breastplates and helmets as well, so they're quite difficult to wound. But because of their longer blades, and especially when you come up against lancers as well, Polish lancers, for example, um, it's difficult to reach them if you've only got a 33-inch blade, especially on a horse. So perhaps it was someone who wanted to adopt the new pattern, but didn't want to give up the reach that they'd had with an earlier model of sword. Maybe they'd had a particularly big 1788 like this one, and they wanted to replace it with a humongous 1796. Now, one thing I have to make clear, this is an officer's sword. It's not the trooper's model. The troopers, this is a trooper's model here. You'll notice the trooper's model has these ears at the side with a rivet that goes through. Um, and this is an officer's version. Um, it has a wire over the leather of the grip. It doesn't have those ears. But that being said, it's not decorated. So the weird thing is, is if this is a fancy officer's sword, an officer who just wanted <laughs> said went into the to the maker and said, "I want the biggest saber you can make for me." then why isn't it more decorated? Uh, there is a little bit of decoration, and another thing which gives away this as being an officer's version, you'll notice it's not in the best condition, it's got quite a lot of pitting, but is this little detailing on the inside of here and the general slenderness of the guard. So the combination of ha not having these ears on the side of the back piece, having the wire wrap on the grip, and having the decoration on the guard here, very much marks this out as an officer's weapon, but it's not a fancy officer's weapon, it's a fighting weapon. So given that it's not decorated, it's not embellished, it's got no engraving, it's got no gilding or anything like that, would it really be a shop display? Would it really be a presentation or, you know, sort of show off piece? I don't think so, because if you were a maker or a shop wanting to make some amazing, impressive thing to, you know, to, to show off your wares, you'd put something, some decoration on an officer's sword, wouldn't you? You wouldn't just have a plain one. So why is this a plain fighting officer's sword in a humongous size. Well, 
I don't know, is the answer. I can only assume that someone was either massive or wanted one that was as big as a heavy cavalry or a very big example of an earlier light cavalry sword. And so they did it. Um, and, you know, there's always someone out there who wants a bigger sword. And um, whatever is the standard size or whatever is the size range, they'll always want one that's bigger than that. And maybe this is an example of that. But it is truly extraordinary how massive this thing is compared to the typical 1796, number one. But number two, it's absolutely extraordinary that I can wield this thing relatively easily on foot. Uh, I mean, it's just got a colossal amount of reach to it, uh, but very, very thin, very, very flexible. So I hope that's brightened your day up. I, I, if you know a more extraordinary Napoleonic Wars sword, I mean, there's many, cat there's many ways we could uh, qualify for that. Things which were owned by famous people, Lloyd's patriotic fun swords that are worth a huge amount of money. But at the end of the day, I think in its own humble way, this qualifies as one of the most extraordinary, perhaps the most extraordinary Napoleonic Wars sword that I've ever owned or held. Comments underneath, very, very welcome. Uh, I'll answer questions if I can, and uh, I hope to see you back here again soon on the channel. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.